I'm a forester by training, so I spent time at University of Melbourne learning to uh, grow trees for timber production. And my business um, manages around about 40 or 50 properties throughout Gippsland. We grow timber on those properties. We're also well involved in farming. We have um, several hundred cows, we have sheep as well. So that's my, my background. But I want to tell you a little bit about my personal journey. I'm going to rewind about 12 years. 12 years ago, I was living in a little, um, a little uh, town on the coast in Victoria. Um, I'd been married for about five years. My wife and I had had a little baby girl. Uh, we were re renovating an old house. I was running my own business. And from the outside looking in, you'd think, wow, John, you, you're living the Australian dream. Isn't that great? But for me personally, I was a little bit unsettled, actually. I was trying to work out why I was unsettled. And as I did a bit of one of those self-assessments on my life, I sort of looked and I thought, you know, I'm probably awake for perhaps 100 hours a week, give or take. I'm probably working 50, sometimes 60 hours a week, probably thinking about my job maybe another 10, 20, you know. I started out up and I thought, man, you know, am I really putting, you know, 70, 80% of everything that I do all into my job? Now, my job's good, but did I really want it to be that much of my life? And as a Christian guy, I sort of looked at my life and thought, I should be giving something to those less fortunate than myself. I really believe in that. And yeah, I volunteered and did things, but I thought, you know, did I get the privilege of going to university to learn what I have, the experiences I've had, the opportunities I've had? Did I get all that just to put mostly back into my own career? And I thought, no, there's got to be something more here. So I started to explore a bit. I talked to lots of people. I read some books. And in the end, I'd started to do some travel to explore what, what is it, what could I do, how could I use what I have, the gifts and the skills and the experiences I've had, uh, to do something a little bit more. So, um, this is my wife and my very shy daughter um, 12 years ago and um, we took a trip to West Africa, much to the uh, raised eyebrows of several members of our family, what on earth would you be wanting to do that for? And we went to West Africa, having never been to Africa before. We travelled a little bit. We'd been to some developing countries in Asia, but this was a really big trip. And the region that we went to was some of the poorest in the world. When they do those indexes of uh, development and, and wealth, these countries come in right down the bottom. When you first go, uh, I think the term shocked is, for some, um, turn your life upside down. You sort of you realise you've been living in a bit of a bubble. And the first thing that hits you is the, the gap between our lives here and their lives there. As you can see from this photo, life is very, very basic. Now, I don't want to confuse happiness with possessions here because there's some very happy and joyful people in Africa, but they live on very little. And sometimes even the basic things for humans to survive and prosper are missing. So nutrition, um, education, um, those sorts of things aren't often available. And I think the thing that struck me the most was the kids. Being a father myself, suddenly you, you have this connection with kids that you didn't have before. And I remember being really struck by this young girl. It was explained to me in the village we've visited that this young girl was looking after her brother. She had most likely um, lost mum and dad probably to HIV. And her lot in life now is to look after her brother. And um, she was living with a relative. Now, the statistics in this particular country was that probably one in five kids don't make it past the age of five. That was life. That, and, and for me, I look at that picture now and I think there's a very strong chance one or neither of those kids are still alive because they don't even have parents look after them. So life was always going to be very tough. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if I... No, actually, I think I can safely say every person here, if you walk past a kid like that in this street today, you would stop and help them. In fact, a lot of us would want to take them home and look after them. But when you're in a place like West Africa, you see those kids every day and you can't look after them all. And so for me, one of the hardest things was how is it that I can walk past this child here today and go home to where I'm staying? But if that happened in Australia, it'd be, you know, there's no way you would do that. How do, I, how do I reconcile that? How do I, how do I deal with that? And to be honest, after my time in West Africa, I went home, and I went home, there were nights I didn't sleep. There was a lot of struggle there. I was trying to work out, how do you, what do you do with this? 
Now that I know what I know, how do I do with this? You can become overwhelmed very quickly. There are hundreds of kids like this little girl. There's hundreds of families struggling. And the job is so big, so what do I do? Some would just go, oh, look, it's Africa, it's the way it is, and you shut it out and you get on with your life. Others go, look, this is overwhelming, I'm getting depressed, I don't know how to deal with it. I, I didn't want to be in either of those camps. I wanted to do something about it. But for me, as a person who works with trees, I thought, you know, how do I deal, what do I, how am I going to do something? I'm not a healthcare worker, I'm not, uh, I'm not a doctor, a teacher. What, you know, they're the normal jobs for aid and development people. I'm a forester, I grow trees. But you know what, after some time, I realised that actually I'm more part of the solution than I ever dreamed. Because most people in Africa are like this lady here. They're what we call a subsistence farmer. They have a little plot of land. Maybe it's a few hundred metres by a few hundred metres. Maybe it's if they're a bit better off, they might have a few acres. And what they grow off that land every year is all that they have. There's no bank account. There's no reserves. They might have a few animals. If they're, they're doing well, they might have a cow or something. They get some milk. They might have a few chooks. They might eat meat once or twice a year if they're lucky. But they're living on the most vulnerable situation because if there's a drought or there's a windstorm or a hailstorm or a flood knocks out their crops, they, uh, they're in real strife. So I started to realise, wow, you know, some of these countries I'm visiting, there's 80 to 90% of the people, that is their lot in life. There's not a lot of job opportunities and not a lot of development or industry. So you're a subsistence farmer first and foremost. That's the reality for most people. And what I realised is trees and farming, better farming practices, are at the core of the solution. Because you see, if you can lift those people out of that situation and make them more profitable and sustainable in their farming, actually then they've got income to sell and do other things like afford vaccinations, schooling for their kids, and suddenly you're lifting them out of poverty and you're getting to the, the root of the issue. I thought, wow, this is amazing. John, you've actually got a greater opportunity here than you ever thought to make a difference. And I realised the role of trees and agroforestry was huge. You see, there's a huge problem in Africa, and that is that they clear the trees very quickly because they need the land for cropping and growing food. Imagine living in a country where the population doubles every 20 years. That's what's happening in a lot of these places. So the pressure on the land to produce food is enormous. So they clear the trees and they put their crops down, and the crops go all right for a few years, but then the rain washes the nutrients through the soil, the wind storms blow the topsoil away or the water washes it away and pretty soon the crops start failing. And what we're finding in Africa is that the agricultural productivity is just going further and further down, yet the population's going up so fast. So there's this huge collision course. It's a massive problem. But trees, they're God's gift to us. They do an amazing job. Trees put their roots deep down in the soil. They hold the soil together. Their, their roots can tap into nutrients that have been leached through and they bring them back up and they deposit them back through the leaves and the bark as it falls on the ground. There are species of trees that will fix nitrogen from the air and put it back in the soil, a natural fertiliser. They protect from wind. They grow timber, they grow fruits, they grow nuts. They are a fantastic solution here. And I thought, wow, John, all this stuff you already knew, this stuff that you work with, you can make a difference. So we've been teaching farmers about an alternative. Instead of just growing some crops, imagine a farm that looks a bit more like this. And when they can see it, they realise, wow, I can grow my crops. And then I can have another level in the middle there is coffee being grown. And then up the top, at the back there, are nitrogen-fixing, timber-producing trees that go over the top. Man, suddenly I've got three levels here. I've got three different products. And if I run some animals as well, I can use the manure to fertilise the trees and then... And feed the fruit and vegetable scraps to the animals. And suddenly, we're not talking 5 or 10% increase in yield here, we're talking hundreds of percentage. The difference in the potential is enormous. And this is sustainable, and we're taking away a lot of the risks because they've got different products. If one fails, the other one's going to work well. Here's another example. This is, this is uh, beans and watermelons on the ground, bananas in the middle, and then that's a, that's a mango tree in the background. So terrific potential and I started to think, wow, there's so much difference we can make here. So my wife and I got together and we set up this organisation, we've called it Beyond Subsistence. Let's get beyond that, you know, hand and mouth living. And in the last 10 years we've had this most incredible journey, I think I've been to Africa somewhere between 15 and 20 times, I've lost count. 
Um, and we've spent our time, I probably go two trips, two or three trips a year. We've uh, adapted a course that was set up here in Australia called the Master Tree Growers course. We've, we've worked with the founder of that course and developed it for Africa. We've now trained over 500 farmers in this agroforestry, life-changing stuff in uh, about four different countries. And not satisfied with that, in recent years we've just started these new programs working in the schools because in so many areas in Africa, particularly HIV, has knocked out a lot of the mums and dads. So you're down to the kids. So let's get into schools and teach them these principles right from the beginning. You've seen kitchen garden programs in Australia. Well, this is kitchen gardens on steroids. I tell you, these kids, they're learning how to grow masses of vegetables, trees, uh, fruits, and they're learning about doing that and feed, they feed themselves at lunchtime because they don't often have lunches. And the nutrition improvements, they're taking it back to their villages and we're starting from the bottom up. The other program we do, this is a fantastic one, they clear a lot of the trees, as I said, because most people in a lot of the countries I visit, 80, 90% of people need firewood every day to boil their water um, and they need it some places to keep warm to cook their food. And they're using so much wood and so many of the kids are walking to collect that wood. We just heard about collecting water, same sort of thing. So these stoves, they're just made out of mud. It's just clay and grass and water mixed together and, and it's a clever little engineering design there. It, it suddenly reduces their firewood use by two thirds. Isn't that amazing? And it's, a, it's free, they can rebuild it any time. If it you know, lasts a few years, they rebuild it again. We've trained over 200 families to do that. For around about 100 Australian dollars, we can achieve that. And this, this changes things in a big way. So we're, we're putting more trees in, but we're stopping them being taken out to the same degree. Now, I've only, I'm, I'm, I could speak all day today about the incredible outcomes that we've seen through this, and it's blown me away. It's been far greater than I ever expected. But I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share one specific one with you. This, um, this is a group that we trained in the highlands of Ethiopia in a, in a training course a few years ago. And this is an area where farming was, was, the conditions were good, but people were farming very poorly. They were not getting along well. Uh, there was not cohesion. And in this group, um, after we trained them, they decided to form their own group and start doing stuff together. Now, I had nothing to do with this other than encouraging them, empowering them, believing in them. And when I came back two years later, they said, look, we decided to tackle erosion. Erosion's a huge problem in our area. We clear all the trees, the water washes all the soil away, then we lose the farmland. They said, we're going to start with our own community here. We've got a big erosion gully. We want to do something about it. This is what it looked like when they started. And I came back two years later and I said, John, we want to show you what we've achieved. See those groups of trees either side? That's what it looked like two years later. And I had nothing to do with it, and that is the greatest part. They are doing it themselves by believing, empowering them, challenging them, encouraging them. They're getting on and doing it. We've had two people this year that we've trained end up getting scholarships to go overseas, such has been their work. Uh, we've had people start their own brands of honey. They started selling fruits commercially, doing all sorts of fantastic things because we've believed in them, because we've encouraged them. The trees are part of it, but the lives are the main part. As we transform lives, we see it responding in the, in the landscape as well. That's all I've got time for. Thanks for listening. The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.